To all those people watching, I'd like to remind everyone that this video is not made for kids. It's for older fans and adults. Enjoy the fucking video! There's a place, alive with the magic of imagination and all the colours of the rainbow. Well done! Bravo! Bravo! There's a place where the heart and mind always play together. This is big! Ah, yes indeed! There's a place to learn from, laugh about and grow with. I wish it! There's a place that's miles from the everyday yet so close to home. There's a place where friends are funny, furry, and often four-legged. There's a very special place just waiting for you. It's called ABC for Kids, the best in children's entertainment to take home on video today. One evening, Thomas arrived at the junction with his last train for the day. The fat controller was there waiting for him. Well done, Thomas. You're a rash on time and really reliable. Thomas was pleased. Oh, thank you, sir. And with that, you'll be rewarded. The Railway Museum on the mainland is holding a special exhibition known as the Great Railway Show. And they want you to be there amongst other engines too. The Railway Museum, whistled Thomas excitedly. Oh, doubly thank you, sir. I had already made the arrangements. You'll be going there in the next two weeks. Thomas was excited, but not all were pleased. I don't believe it, said Gordon furiously. What's Thomas got that an important engine like me hasn't? Gather that to go to museums. Pah! Oh, me, added James. A splendid red engine! It's not fair, added Henry crossly. We work hard as well. Why did the fat controller choose him instead of us, or any other engine? Because, Henry, the railway museum had told me that many children had specifically requested him to join in, and I'm obliged to do it. Henry, Gordon and James all ignored Thomas whenever they saw him at the junction. But Thomas didn't care. They're only jealous, he would say. Later he was talking to Toby and Percy about his upcoming visit. Fancy the Railway Museum had asked me to join other famous engines because they wanted to see me, he boasted. You should be careful, Thomas, replied Toby cautiously. We are pleased that you get to go to the museum and represent our railway, but don't forget that arrogance of yours caused you to smash into a wall at the station master's house once. But Thomas didn't listen. He was too busy thinking about the railway museum. How much longer until we go? Thomas would say to his crew each morning. One day less than when you asked before, laughed his driver. Will Stepney be there, or Duck's celebrity friend? We shall have to wait and see replied his fireman. Thomas just got more and more excited. But the next day it began to rain. But despite that it didn't dampen Thomas' spirit. Best be careful Thomas. The rails are very slippery from this rain. Oh don't worry Percy. The rain is not letting me down today. Percy smiled. I wish me, Daisy and Toby came along with you to the museum. But then who will look after my branch line then? Bertie couldn't handle the work alone. Soon the signal was down and Thomas puffed away. Bye Percy! Meanwhile up the line, the signalman, who was waiting for Thomas to pass, was having trouble with the crossing gates. The signal showed that the line was clear, 
but the crossing gates were closed for coming engines. The signalman was working hard to fix the problem. That was until Thomas was coming into view. He passed the green signal. Away we go, away we go, he puffed. But by the time he had passed the signal box, it was already too late. Look out! cried his driver and applied the brakes. But Thomas's wheels slipped on the line. Ouch! he exclaimed. No one was hurt, but splintered wood from the crossing gate had landed all over him, and the impact had bent Thomas's front. The fat controller arrived. Oh dear, Thomas. It was an accident, sir, he replied meekly. Ah, no. The signalman had told me about the problem, and he should have placed the signal at danger instead. Would I still be able to go to the railway museum, sir? Hmm, I don't think I clear to run looking like that. But I made a promise to the children, and I must keep it. I've had a good solution before tomorrow. Later, the fat controller came to see him in the yards. I contacted the museum, and they agreed to repair you until you arrive. However, you'll be taken to the museum by lorry instead. A l lorry? Thomas stammered. Yes, Thomas. You will leave tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock sharp. The next day at the junction, everyone came to see Thomas off. Thomas was most embarrassed. I told you, replied Toby. James, Gordon, Henry came to the junction as well, and they laughed when they saw Thomas. The fat controller scolded them. The shame would happen to you if you were in Thomas's place, he said crossly. Gordon, Henry and James were quiet. Goodbye, Thomas, he said. Enjoy yourself and be a credit to our railway. But Thomas was feeling rather doubtful. Thomas had an accident with the level crossing, so the fat controller sent him to the railway museum by lorry. He enjoyed the look of the countryside, but began to feel bored for being perched onto a lorry. How undignified, he thought, and he went to sleep. He was thinking about Gordon, Henry and James and how they laughed at him back at the junction. How can I be a credit to the fat controller's railway after being so boastful and overexcited? Thomas arrived at a big building with rails running through it. Welcome to the railway museum, Thomas, said one of the workmen. Thomas was delighted. He had arrived. The lorry parked nearby the yard, and after Thomas was carefully placed back onto the rails, he was taken to the museum's workshops as promised. Well, I never thought I'd see you again came a voice from inside the shed. Thomas was surprised to see Stepney the Bluebell Engine standing next to him. Stepney! Thomas gasped. What are you doing here? <laughs> Same thing as you are, chuckled Stepney. I'm taking part in the Great Railway Show. Oh my, what happened to you? He said. Then Thomas explained about his accident. Oh dear, replied Stepney. Well, the museum will get you as good as new. I'll just be checked over to see if I'm good enough to run. And after that, I'll be polished. The two friends began catching up with each other since they last met. At last, Thomas was repaired. Goodbye, Thomas. Have fun at the show. Thomas was sorry to leave Stepney behind. But when Thomas parked himself in the museum yard, he saw all sorts of engines. One of them was Duck's celebrity friend. Hello, greeted Thomas. Nice to see you again, Thomas, 
said the famous engine. There were other engines too, one of which was an engine that Gordon had seen once on Sodor with two tenders sticking out from the shed, and other engines that Thomas had never even met. When the children saw him, they surrounded Thomas with all their parents. His photographs were taken and people were taking notes. There's no denying it, you're a star of attraction. Is that being a credit to the fat controller? whispered Thomas. He was still anxious about his accident. The engines offered people rides around the museum yard of a great railway show. Different engines puffed backwards and forwards offered demonstrations and lots of people crowd the fences to get a good look at one of these engines. One day, Thomas's driver came looking very excited. Hello driver, what are you so happy about? We're going to be taking rides for the visitors, replied his driver. Thomas was worried. He saw the crowd and was worried about what might happen to them. Everyone had heard about Thomas's presence and came to see him on the demonstration line. He had never seen such a crowd before. We'd best be careful, driver, he told his driver anxiously. What would happen if a child had got onto the line? Thomas's driver tried to reassure him. Don't worry, Thomas. They have strong barriers to hold people. But Thomas did worry. He was afraid that in an emergency he might not stop in time. But as the day wore on, he was relieved that no one had fallen onto the line. He took a break, parked alongside Stepney, and the two began chatting again. The ride demonstration was wonderful, he told Stepney. I was worried about the crowds, but they seem to be in good order today. Don't be too relaxed though, Thomas, warned Stepney. The museum manager had decided he wants you to do more of those trains tomorrow because of who you are. Everyone is different. I'm sure everything will be all right tomorrow, Stepney, replied Thomas. The next day the sun was shining and he was happy. More crowds had come to see Thomas and he began chuntering up and down the demonstration line. Meanwhile in the museum grounds there was a visitor who was rude and aggressive. Get out of my way! He grunted as he posed for his photograph. The other visitors didn't like him. I don't care. I want to get as many nice pictures as I can, and I don't want others standing in my way. The other engines who were on display didn't like him either, but they had to put up with it in the end. The visitors began to complain to management about the rude visitor. We'll deal with him, ma'am, replied the manager. It was almost closing time, and the rude visitor was just about to sit down and eat from his lunch bag when he saw Thomas. Oh, I better get him, he said. Thomas, meanwhile, was enjoying himself again. What a day, what a day. Stepney was wrong about today, too. But he didn't know about the rude visitor. He had rudely pushed through the crowd. Hey, what the? Say excuse me, they shouted. But the visitor didn't care. I need to get a picture of this tank engine, he shouted. He pushed through another crowd, and then it happened. The visitor had accidentally thrown his lunch sack right towards the demonstration track. Thomas saw it happen and so did his driver. Quickly they applied the brakes. I must stop! I must stop! whistled Thomas at alarm. His wheels screeched hard on the rails. The bag exploded! Sandwiches and crisps as well as fizz from a drink bottle flew everywhere over the tracks, the visitors and Thomas. Smoke and steam hissed loudly from Thomas's cylinders. Is everyone all right? He asked the visitors. But the visitors were cross, and a small child hid behind his mother after all of the noise, and he began to cry. I want to go home, Mummy. Now! Thomas is scary! The mother was cross. You noisy great engine! She yelled to Thomas. My son was looking forward to meeting you, and you made his day a misery. Not to mention my clothes have been spoiled. I'm going to speak to the manager! Don't blame Thomas, ma'am, replied one of the visitors. It was him, and they pointed to the rude visitor. He's been pushing it to people all day for a photograph. The museum manager was even cross as well. We've been looking all over for you all day, he said to the rude visitor sternly. We've been getting a lot of complaints about your rudeness today towards our visitors, and we don't allow that in the museum. I want you to leave immediately. The rude visitor soon left feeling bad after what he had caused. 
Meanwhile, Thomas's driver and fireman were looking over Thomas to see if any damage was done, while Thomas stood feeling very bad. Don't blame yourself, Thomas. It was that rude visitor who caused the accident, sued his driver. You did very well to stop, and thankfully it wasn't a child on the line, added the fireman. Just then he noticed something. Hey, look at this! Thomas's brakes are jammed. So they are, replied the driver. Looks like a trip to the workshop for you again, Thomas. I hope everyone here today had learned that engines can't stop at once. Thomas hoped they had. While Thomas was being repaired following his incident with the lunch sack, he began to doubt himself being a credit to the Fat Controller's railway. I left the Fat Controller down, he sighed. First the level crossing gates at home, not looking out for people's safety and scaring children. How can I be a credit to his railway if I can't do things right? Don't be like that, Thomas. We all make mistakes every day. You are a credit to the Fat Controller's railway. Soon Thomas was fitted with new brakes and then he puffed his way to the other engines. He could see that they were chatting excitedly about something. What's going on? He asked Stepney. The museum manager is conducting some special trains to the seaside, Stepney replied excitedly, but we don't know who would be chosen to pull it. It ought to be me, observed one of the engines. You hauled those trains last time, replied the famous engine crossly. Let someone else have a go for a change. They all argue about who should pull the seaside trains. Thomas didn't think he should pull it after what had happened to him for the previous days, but he enjoyed listening to the other engines arguing. Then the museum manager came to see the engines. I'm sure you've all heard about the seaside train, he asked. Yes, sir, replied the engines. I had therefore chosen an engine to pull those trains, and the honor will go to Stepney. Oh, thank you, sir cheered Stepney happily and he gave a happy peep on his whistle. The other engines however were all jealous. The rest of you shall be on display today, the manager further added. So be good to our visitors and if there are any rude ones like the one from yesterday, please tell your driver so they can report it. Good day to you all. The other engines huffed away, still annoyed that Stepney was chosen over them. But Stepney didn't care what they thought. They're only jealous, he said to Thomas. Thomas smiled. He was glad that his friend was given the trains, but Thomas had warned him. Don't get too over your funnel, Stepney, he said. I was like that back on Sodor before I crashed into the level crossing. Don't worry, Thomas. I'll keep my ego in check. Anyway, time for my first train. And he puffed away to the station to collect his coaches. Oh, and look out for any trouble on the main line. Gotcha, Thomas, peeped Stepney. So many passengers had come to see Stepney and ride on him to the seaside. His train was heavy and he was already tired by the time he returned to the museum. I had never seen so many people. The manager saw this and thought of an idea to help. We could put on extra trains, he said. But Stepney just looked at him doubtfully. I'm already tired as I am, sir, he said. You're right, replied the manager, and then said, but all we could do is add extra coaches. But then Stepney can't pull a train that heavy on his own. Thomas still believes that he wasn't worthy of pulling the trains. But he could see that his friend Stepney needed help. Can I help? Why yes, Thomas, of course. You are stronger than Stepney, so you could pull the train while he leads. Stepney was pleased. 
Thanks, Thomas. What a true friend you are. The next morning, Thomas and Stepney had their fires ready and were cleaned, polished and oiled, ready for the day's journey to the seaside. The station was jam-packed with a crowd of admirers as Stepney and Thomas pulled in with their coaches. Then as the passengers climbed aboard, the two engines set off for the seaside. This is heavy! Thomas puffed as he felt the strain of the coaches from his coupling, but he and Stepney puffed on with a heavy train. They puffed next to the sea, which was close to the line. Thomas could see that the tide was high and he was worried. That tide looks threatening, he said to Stepney. Well, we better look out if any danger lurks, Thomas, replied Stepney. They arrived at the seaside station and both engines were turned round ready for the return trip. Then after a rest, the two engines set off back to the museum station. Thomas could see that the water was getting closer and closer. He tried to tell Stepney, but a group of people had gathered nearby to see the two engines puffing past. Stepney saw them and gave a friendly whistle. Hello, he called. He wasn't paying attention to what Thomas was trying to say. Then Thomas saw something through Stepney's window, and he gasped for what he saw was up ahead. Beep, beep, stop, stop, he whistled an alarm. The two engines applied their brakes, but the heavy trains surged against them. Luckily, they had stopped just in time. The passengers were wondering why they stopped and looked out of their windows. In front of Stepney, the rails close to the sea were lower than the ones on the other side. Stepney was surprised. If we'd been anywhere closer, we could have been derailed. Thank you, Thomas. It's great that you were here to help out. An inspector, who was on the train, came out to see the problem. The water has undermined the embankment. I'll sort things out with the signalman. Then Thomas had an idea. Why don't we push the train over some points and use the track next to us? He asked. Splendid idea. I'll explain that to the signalman. Well done, Thomas. So the arrangements were made and Thomas and Stepney carefully pushed the heavy train backwards to the points that crossed them over to the other track. Once they were on the other track, the two engines puffed carefully past the landslip. Steady we go, steady we go, puffed Thomas. As the last coach passed the embankment, everyone was at last safe. The passengers all cheered. Well done, Thomas, they cried. And so the two engines made their way back to the museum station. The next day, a party of important looking people came to the museum to see the engines. Thomas was surprised to see the museum manager talking to the fat controller. Oh no, thought Thomas. They come to take me away from frightening that child but the fat controller was smiling. Thomas, said the manager, your controller told us you are a really useful engine. He is right. Although you had some mishaps along the way, you saved our passengers from a nasty accident yesterday after your and Stepney's run to the seaside. So we decided to give you this special plate to remind you of what you did and your time with us at the museum. Ladies, gentlemen, boys and girls, three cheers for Thomas the Tank Engine. Everyone cheered, and the engines whistled happily for Thomas. Thomas smiled happily, and he was also given a hero's welcome when he came back to Sodor. The engines had all heard about Thomas's clever and heroic actions. Even Gordon, Henry, and James were impressed as well. Well, John Thomas, smirked the fat controller. I knew you would be a credit to our railway.
It was winter on the island of Sodor. The snow came and it covered the island in a thick blanket of white and was causing trouble to the Fat Controller's railway. This means that some of the engines have to wear their snow plows. Snow is nothing but trouble, huffed Thomas. What's wrong with snow? asked Daisy. I think it looks pretty. Huh, you don't know anything about the snow because you don't wear a snow plow. I wouldn't wear such an ugly thing anyway. If I saw a snow drift, I would just push it aside. It's just silly soft stuff. Toby and Percy quietly chuckled at the two arguing. Daisy sounds quite like Thomas when it comes to snow, snickered Percy. Push it aside? Nonsense! You'll know that once you come to a snowdrift, Daisy. Daisy sniffed and she rolled away to collect her passengers. At the junction, Daisy was waiting for Gordon with the express. More snowflakes were falling and Daisy was immersed by the sight of it all. What fun, she said. Thomas may not like snow, but I think it's pretty. <laughs> it's just silly soft stuff. Thomas is wrong. But her driver wasn't so confident though, and talked to the guard. Daisy isn't as strong as a steam engine, so let's hope for the best that the storm doesn't get any worse. You remember what happened to Thomas, don't you? He told us often enough, laughed the guard. Finally, Gordon arrived with the express. He was complaining about engines that were frightened by a bit of snow. It's no problem for me. A few flimsy flakes can't stop me, Daisy boasted. Quite right, approved Gordon. But I haven't gotten time to chat. I must be off. I'm late because of the snow. And he puffed quickly but importantly away. After he left, the blizzard got worse. But Daisy was still confident as she rolled away to Thomas's branch line. But soon the snow began hitting her face. Ugh! She exclaimed. I don't like this! Neither did her driver. Soon she saw a snowdrift ahead. It's just in soda, she thought. She revved her engine and charged towards it. But then she was stuck. She cried. The driver tried to back her up, but her wheels spun helplessly on the track. Oh, come on, come on, he said. But try as she might, Daisy couldn't move. Her passengers were anxious. The driver made his way to the nearest signal box to report the matter. He came back looking glum and then told the passengers. There are deep drifts ahead, so we can't get through. We'll get you home from here somehow, if we're lucky replied the passengers to themselves. The driver tried to move Daisy back again, but still wouldn't move. Then Daisy began to cough, pick up, and then stopped. Help! She wheezed. I can't breathe properly. Her driver came out again to inspect, and he found the problem. Your air intake is blocked. I better clear it. But no matter how many times he had cleared it, more snow began blocking it. Daisy was almost close to tears. Meanwhile, Thomas was clearing snow near Harold's airfield. Just then, Harold's pilot received the message. Where are you going? Thomas asked. Daisy is stuck in the snow further down the line, replied Harold. I'm off to rescue her passengers. Thomas watched as Harold zoomed away thinking how he was right all along. Meanwhile, Daisy was feeling depressed. How long until help comes? She asked her driver, but even her driver couldn't cheer her up. Goodness knows how long, he sighed. Then suddenly they heard a whirring noise. Oh no, not another blizzard, thought Daisy. But it wasn't a blizzard. It was Harold the helicopter. He delivered some hot drinks for the passengers, and after that, they climbed into him one by one. Then Harold took them to the airfield where they were looked after until Bertie took them to their homes. But Daisy was still left alone in the snow feeling cold, lonely and miserable. It took a while but by night time Thomas had finally reached her. What do you think of snow now, Daisy? He quipped. Not so pretty now? 
No, sighed Daisy. Thomas saw how sad Daisy was, and then remembered his time in the snow before Terence had rescued him. He began to feel bad for teasing her. Thomas was coupled to her, and then took her back to the yards to get warm. Donald and Douglas were rushed off their wheels, pulling passengers and trucks on Duck and Oliver's branch line, as well as the main line. The fat controller noticed this and promised to find an engine to help. He then went on his way to visit a friend who lives on the mainland and told him about the problem. His friend had an idea of who the engine could be. His friend took him to a railway that runs through a forest. Puffing into the station was a blue tank engine like Percy, but way bigger. This is Wilbert, the fat controller's friend declared. Very nice to meet you, Wilbert. The same to you as well, sir, replied Wilbert politely. Then the fat controller explained the problem. Would you like to visit the island of Shodor to help out? Oh yes, sir, peeped Wilbert excitedly. His line through the forest was short, and he was glad of a nice long run. Back on Sodor, Percy was thrilled when he heard the news. Another tank engine, sir, he said. Like me, sir. Oh, I can't wait to see him. The fat controller chuckled. He's bigger than you, Percy. But I'll be needed on Duck and Oliver's line, so I don't think he'll be able to meet him. During the week before Wilbert came, it was raining. It had rained for days, and the engines hated it. None of them wanted to get out, but they knew that passengers and trucks were waiting, and they would have to put up with it. Percy was taking some trucks from the quarry to the harbour. His driver looked out from his cab. Just the sort of weather when you need porridge for breakfast, he laughed. What's porridge? Percy asked. Well, you boil oatmeal and water, began the fireman, and then it's some sort of sticky soup, and then you add milk and sugar to it. Delicious finished the driver. That doesn't sound delicious to me, thought Percy. At the junction, some men were stacking sacks of oatmeal on the platform quite roughly. Soon a signal dropped, and Percy's whistle can be heard in the distance. Percy's coming, called the station master. One of the men swung the last heavy sack, and it knocked the top ones over. Then his fireman noticed the fallen sacks on the line. Look out! He yelled, and the driver applied the brakes. Percy wasn't going fast, but he couldn't stop in time. He plowed straight into the porridge. Yuck! Percy spluttered. The porridge had splashed everywhere around his face, and it dripped everywhere from buffer to wheel. The crew went down to inspect, and then they laughed. But Percy didn't think it was funny, and he told his driver just how terrible porridge is for an engine. The crew apologized to Percy for laughing, and went to contact the fat controller about the problem. He didn't find the situation quite funny either. I'll contact the signalman at the junction to stop Wilbert there. So he did. Wilbert arrived as the signalman flagged him down, and told him what the fat controller had said. Wilbert parked at the sheds to stay out of the rain. He saw Percy still covered in porridge, while his crew went to get buckets of hot water to wash him down. Percy gasped, and then he saw the name on the tank engine's boiler. So you're Wilbert? Correct, he replied. Percy cheered up at once. But before he could say anything else, 
Wilbert started to laugh. What's so funny? Percy asked crossly. What happened to you? You look like a nice cake on wheels. Then Percy explained the situation. You silly engine. Engines aren't supposed to eat porridge. Percy was cross by Wilbert's rudeness. The next day, Percy was still being cleaned and the fat controller came to see Wilbert at the station. Since Percy's out of action, I want you to look after his work until he's better. Wilbert was delighted. His first job was to take the milk trucks to the dairy. The fat controller had warned him about two standpipes. But Wilbert was so excited about his first run that he forgot all about that. As they reached the dairy, Wilbert replied, I'm thirsty. They shunted the train into a siding and stopped by a hose pipe. The fireman placed a hose into Wilbert's tank and his driver turned the tap on. But Wilbert thought the water felt strange. That's not water, cried the dairy manager. That's milk. Wilbert was shocked. Oh, get it out, get it out. Wilbert's crew had put his fire out and they called for help. Soon Percy came, and it was his turn to laugh. You and I make a fine pair, he quipped. I had the porridge, and you had the milk. Then Wilbert saw the funny side of it all, and both he and Percy laughed. Wilbert had apologised for laughing at Percy. I was just so excited about coming to the island that I'd forgotten my manners. It's alright, replied Percy, and I'll see the funny side of it as well. And the two engines laughed. When the milk was all cleaned out of Wilbert's tank, and Percy now working again, the fat controller sent Wilbert to Duck's branch line. But everyone had heard about the milk incident and couldn't help but tease him. When Wilbert stopped to have a drink, Gordon came by with the express. Is that milk or water? He teased. Wilbert does tend to see the funny side, but all the same, he did feel a bit embarrassed about it. I must prove that I'm really useful, he thought to himself. And when he was topped up with water, he puffed away. Wilbert arrived on Duck and Oliver's branch line, and the two Great Western engines made him very welcome. Duck showed him around the branch line so he could see what the line was like. Wilbert was amazed by the sea. i never seen the sea before, he gasped. Ow, ow, ow! Oliver was worried by Wilbert's handling of the trucks. You shouldn't be bumping them like that, he said. They can be troublesome. And he then told Wilbert about how the trucks surged him down to a turntable well. Oh, they don't look too troublesome to me, he said to Oliver, and he bumped them again. Oh, what a piece of work, fumed one of the trucks, bumping us around without any respect, said another. These mainland engines, why are they so gullible? Leave them to me, I'll send it packing, said a well-known voice. It was scruffy. Although Oliver had pulled him apart by accident, the fat controller had restored him with better wooden frames. But he was still causing trouble to the other engines, except for Oliver. When I give the order, he whispered to the other trucks. 
The trucks giggled quietly. They were going to have some fun. Soon, Wilbert started. Hold back! Hold back! shouted Scruffy, and the trucks did the same as well. Wilbert struggled on and on, his wheels slipping on the rails. Come on, we better get moving, he called to the trucks. But the trucks didn't care one bit. Hold back! Hold back! Hold back! they chanted. Wilbert kept on puffing, trying to make the trucks move, when suddenly... My coupling gear! cried Scruffy. The workman saw the incident and began rushing straight towards it. Scruffy was sad. Oh, I'm sorry about that, replied Wilbur apologetically. You did that on purpose, growled Scruffy crossly. Me? You were the one holding me back. I apologized for it and you just blame me? In any case, it's your fault that it was broken. And he bumped Scruffy, which made him scared. All right, settle down, you two. I think we need to focus on right now is how we're going to get these trucks moving. Everyone was trying to think of something, and so was Scruffy. Fireman, why not use that coil of wire? I'm sure it's strong enough to make us pull the trucks. Scruffy was rather doubtful. You never move a train with wire, he objected. We could at least try. Wilbert's crew took his word and with permission granted by the workman, they coiled the wire around Scruffy's buffer beam and placed the wire on Wilbert's coupling hook. Then at last, everything was ready. The guard blew his whistle and Wilbert puffed away with his train. Right, gently now, he thought. Wilbert was a little worried, but he kept on puffing to the big station slowly but surely. Finally, Wilbur arrived at the big station, late but safe. His driver and fireman were delighted. You're a very clever engine, Wilbur. Well done! Even Scruffy had to agree that Wilbur was clever to think of using the coil wire. The fat controller was pleased too and gave Wilbur his highest regard. Wilbert carried on working until it was time for him to leave. Everyone came to see him off. Hope you come back one day, they called. Wilbert smiled. And I hope you come to my railway too. I've had a wonderful time here, but I'm looking forward to getting home. And with a whistle, he puffed away, leaving behind great memories. James is proud of his red paint. He thinks he's the most splendid engine on the island, and he proudly boasts about it to the other engines, which annoys them greatly. I think every engine on the island should be painted red like me. I like my green paint, thank you, replied Henry crossly. I hate to be red like you. People would think I would look like tomato sauce on wheels. At least people can see what I am, James retorted. You blend in with the trees and that forest of yours. People won't notice you amongst all that green. The two engines argued until the fat controller came to settle the noise. 
Quiet! Henry, you are to go to the works and have a new coat of green paint as a reward for your hard work. Oh, thank you, sir, replied Henry proudly. But, sir, why should Henry get a new coat? I've been working twice as hard as him. I deserve a new coat of paint. You'll get your shoe, James, replied the fat controller crossly, once you've fixed that attitude of yours. So Henry puffed excitedly away to get a repaint. But the works were very busy with other engines, coaches and trucks that were either getting repainted or repaired, and Sir Henry had to wait in the siding before it was his turn. Never mind, he said to himself, it'll be nice to have a good rest after working so hard. So he did. But as the days passed he began to find life boring in the sidings. He started to become agitated. When is it my turn? he hissed. I've waited here for a few days now. Just then the workman arrived. Okay, Henry, it's time for you to be repainted. Henry was pleased. He backed down into the works. The workman scraped off his old paint until he became bare. Then the workman came with buckets of paint. Here comes the fresh coat, Henry replied happily. But when the workman opened the bucket, Henry was surprised to see red paint instead of green. That's not right, he protested. The fat controller wants me to be green with red stripes, not red like James. The workman laughed and told Henry that it was a special sort of undercoat before his green paint arrives from the mainland. Henry felt silly. Undercoat indeed. What if the other engines see me like this? They would all laugh at me. The workman laughed again and carried on painting Henry. The next day there was a problem. The green paint for Henry had been delayed on the mainland. Henry was annoyed. Then his driver came into the shed with some urgent news from the fat controller. Boko had been broken down and we need to take his train. Henry was shot. He was sorry for poor Boko, but he then thought, I can't go out like this, he exclaimed. Everyone will laugh at me, even James. Can't help that, replied his driver. The other engines are busy, you're the only one available, and it would be a long walk for the passengers to get to their destinations on time. So Henry puffed out of the works, feeling very embarrassed. I feel so silly, I feel so silly, he complained as he made his way to the station. The fat controller and Boko were pleased to see him, but James laughed when he saw him. So you take my advice, Henry, clever engine. Now you don't need to blend in amongst the trees. Henry snorted as James puffed away with his passengers. The express that Henry was pulling was very heavy, and the driver says they should need help on Gordon's Hill. But as they approached Edward Station, there was a problem with the brakes on the last coach, and Henry had to stop. Then to make matters worse, Edward, who was to help Henry to climb Gordon's Hill, was called away on his branch line, and Henry had to shunt the coach himself. Other engines came past and laughed when they saw Henry and his red paint. Henry huffed and finally, he had enough of the engines as teasing. Let them laugh, I'll show them! He was coupled to the train and he snorted away to the hill. He struggled on determined to show everyone that he was still a really useful engine. I can do it, I can do it, he panted. He pulled and puffed the heavy train up the hill. Until finally, he reached the top. I've done it! I've done it! I've done it! He whistled as he glided down the other side. The other engines had heard of Henry's determination and praised him instead of teasing him. James even apologized for his teasing as well, and Henry smiled. 
so did the fat controller, and he told him that he'll be repainted with green paint and red stripes tomorrow. No matter what colour you're in, be it red or green, you'll always be a really useful engine. One day, Thomas, Percy and Duck were waiting at the big station with their coaches when Gordon arrived with the express. Hewlett legends have it easy, he grunted. You don't go about all day running at long distances on the main line with heavy coaches behind you without stopping unless needed. Easy, replied Thomas crossly. We don't have it easy, Gordon. We work hard just as much as you do. <laughs> really? Puffing up and down a straight track with each station not too far from each other. That seems easy enough to me. You little engines don't understand hard work like us big engines. Of course we do, barked Duck. But Gordon just laughed as he puffed away to the sheds to have a rest. That Gordon always too big for his wheels, puffed Percy. And the three engines set off with their passengers. The next day, Gordon was feeling very tired. He had a good sleep, but today Gordon didn't feel up to taking the express. Oh, quit your complaining, Gordon. You just need some more good rest, said James, and he puffed away to collect his trucks. But Gordon didn't have the strength to reply. He was placed in the siding so an inspector can look over and see what was wrong. Finally, Gordon has the strength to speak. I get so out of breath, he complained. But nobody cares. They just say I'll be all right after rest. Percy came into the yards to collect Gordon's coaches. Get the fat controller to give you tanks in a bunker, he suggested cheekily. Us tank engines never get out of breath, you know. Gordon was crossed by Percy's cheekiness, but he hadn't the strength to reply and went to sleep instead. Finally, the inspector came and went to check over Gordon. After his inspection, he came towards the fat controller. Gordon will need new tubes, he declared. He'll have to go to the works to have some new ones fitted. But who will look after my express? The inspector pondered. James and Henry were busy with their own work, but someone has to take the express. The inspector soon spoke to the fat controller again. With no spare engine except for Thomas, he said. But Thomas couldn't pull an express train on his own. Yes, I can, huffed Thomas. I did that when Henry was ill. That may be so, Thomas. But Henry wasn't strong enough then due to his smaller firebox, and now his trains are much heavier. Could Percy help? The fat controller suggested. The inspector shook his head. The two of them were duck might manage. It's only as far as the workstation, so Boko can meet you there and take over the train for them. Although Thomas was annoyed he couldn't take the train on his own, he was pleased to pull the express with Duck and Percy. That was show Gordon that us little engines have it easy. So the three engines were coupled together. Thomas nearest the train, Duck in the middle, and Percy at the front. As the passengers got into the train, the guard blew his whistle and waved his green flag, and the three engines puffed away. It was a heavy train and they had to pull out of the station slowly. Come on, come on, fussed Percy importantly. We're doing it, we're doing it, puffed Duck. Pull harder, pull harder, grumbled Thomas to the others. 
At last, they began to pick up some speed and pulled the train out of the big station. The three engines couldn't go fast as Gordon, but the passengers didn't mind. They knew that Thomas, Percy and Duck were doing their best. The three engines found that express trains weren't like branch line trains. They don't stop at all the stations, and whenever they do, they don't have the time to catch their breath. But the three engines struggled on. Then they came to Gordon's Hill. As they puffed up towards the hill, the strain was beginning to show. We can do it, we can do it, we can do it, they puffed together. They were pleased when the top finally came. I'm glad we didn't stop there, thought Thomas as he, Percy and Duck descended the hill. Gordon will never let us see the last of it. But the hill proved too much for poor Percy. He didn't have enough steam to go on, and so his driver whistled to tell the others to stop the train. We can't uncouple you here, Percy, said his driver, but we're not far now to the workstation, but do the best you can to keep the brakes off. This means that Thomas and Duck were to carry the trains themselves. It was harder for them, but they had managed. We're nearly there, we're nearly there, puffed Thomas and Duck together. They came to the workstation. The little engines could see that, that they were struggling. Come on, come on, whistled Scarlowy. You can do it, added Reneus. The other small engines whistled for them as the three tank engines struggled past their shed. They were just a few yards short of the station when... Oh, I can't go on, I can't go on, whooshed Duck. Then Thomas began to feel the heavy weight of the coaches behind him. Oh, neither can I, he groaned, and so they had to stop. The fat controller, who'd been on the train, came to see the three engines. Well done, you did so well to get so far, and you three deserve a rest. Percy, Duck and Thomas were very relieved. Boko came and took the train. And the three engines, with plenty of steam built up, puffed into the siding. For three little engines, you did very well with the express from what I heard, came a voice. It was Gordon, who had seen the whole thing from the work siding. It looks like you three do work harder than us. I'm sorry for being terrible to you three yesterday. I was just tired from pulling the express often with those old tubes of mine. But I'm right as rain now. And we understand the hard work you go into with the express, replied Thomas. Percy and Duck both agreed.